Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Measuring Methane Emissions from the Waste Sector. Thank you to everyone for joining. Before we start, we're just going to go over a few webinar software tips. So first, there are three ways to connect with the audio today. You can listen through computer speakers, use the Call Me feature to receive an automated call, or use the number included in the webinar invitation to connect. So all participant lines are muted for the duration of the webinar, regardless of the audio method that you chose. If you have any questions, you can enter them into the Q&A panel. And when submitting questions, please make sure that you select all panelists from the drop down menu before hitting send. This will ensure that all of the speakers see the question. In the text of your question, it would be great if you could say which speaker the question is for, and we'll be moderating those at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Final materials, including a recording of the slot, a recording in the slides, um, will be posted to the GMI website, globalmethane.org. We are also going to be asking some poll questions during the webinar. Um, the Slido panel um, that you can see in the little image here um, will appear during the first poll, and to respond, you can just click your answer and hit send. We'll also have some feedback questions at the end of the webinar, and it would be great to get your feedback. So, um, again, if you're just joining, welcome to Measuring Methane Emissions from the Waste Sector. This is part two in the Global Methane Initiative MRV webinar series. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Clara Zimmerman, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm a program manager at the US Environmental Protection Agency, where I work on climate change mitigation through reducing methane emissions from the waste sector. With me today is Kate Siegel, a waste sector manager at Clean Air Task Force, Tom Frankowitz, a waste methane subject matter expert at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and Mackenzie Huffman, the director of strategy and partnerships at Carbon Mapper. Thank you all so much for being here. A brief overview of today's agenda. I'll start with the importance of measuring waste methane emissions. Then we'll hear from about some of the latest developments and technologies for measuring those emissions. We'll hear about the waste methane assessment platform or MAP from Kate and Tom, and then about using satellites to measure methane from McKenzie. So we'll have our first poll question coming on the screen shortly. On a scale of one to five, with five being the highest, how would you rate your knowledge of measuring methane emissions in the waste sector? So that should pop up. Sarah, I am not seeing the poll. Um, it should be on the right hand side of folks' screen. Um, I do see yeah, a um, answer is coming in. So um, let me know if folks still can't see that. Okay, it might be just the presenter view. Sorry about that. Yeah, Sarah, if you could just say what the results are and then we'll move on, that would be great. Sure, it looks like it's a pretty even split between uh, three and four, so closer to the high end. Okay, that's great. So people have a little bit of background, but hopefully there's something they can still learn and take out of today's webinar. So this webinar is hosted by the Global Methane Initiative, or GMI. At GMI, we're focused on advancing the recovery and use of methane as a valuable energy source. We have 46 partner countries, um, which you can see on the map, um, and over 700 project network members. So those include partners in the private sector, NGOs, financial institutions, academic programs, and others. And as a founding member of GMI, the United States through the EPA provides technical support to help deploy methane to energy projects around the world. 
At GMI, we're focused on three key sectors, oil and gas, coal mines, and biogas. Biogas includes agriculture, wastewater, and municipal solid waste. Um, I'll touch briefly on the themes that we covered in our first webinar series, um, which was on the basics of MRV. So measurement reporting and verification, or MRV, involves collecting and tracking greenhouse gas emissions data, reporting data in a standard format, and verifying data accuracy. MRV for biogas projects is critical for building national inventories to meet the transparency requirements of the Paris Agreement. And finally, uh, GMI is a resource hub for countries seeking assistance in developing robust MRV frameworks that capture emissions and emissions reduction. Next, me measuring methane emissions in all sectors is extremely important for transparency and ensuring a strong mitigation actions. The waste sector, including municipal solid waste and wastewater, is a third largest source of anthropogenic methane emissions globally. And to manage those emissions, we'll, we have to be able to measure them. So it's very important to meet for meeting the goals of the Global Methane Pledge as well. Global Methane Pledge was launched in November 2021 and is now signed by 150 countries and encourages those countries to take actions to reduce methane emissions by at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030 globally. And these reductions are intended to keep our goal within reach to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So methane emissions from the waste sector are emitted from dispersed and sometimes unpredictable sources, which makes them difficult to measure. US EPA and GMI have developed several tools to facilitate waste emissions tracking through the Solid Waste Emissions Estimation Tool, or SWEET, and the Anaerobic Digestion Screening Tool. Um, all of our tools are available for free download and use with training materials at globalmethane.org. So we we'll definitely pre recommend those. And then specific to MRV, we've developed several resources for methane management in the waste sector. The MRV handbook includes key elements of a methane measurement plan, methane quantifying techniques, and tools and resources. And we also would recommend checking out the GMR, GMI Resource Center on globalmethane.org slash MRV. And that's shown on the right. It includes um, best practices that are summarized into really quick high level steps. Um, and it's a great beginner's guide um, with other links out to relevant tools and resources for MRV. So uh, we'll try to have our second poll question here. And um, our question is on a scale of one to five, five being the highest, how likely are you to visit the GMI MRV Resource Center and the handbook for guidance on measuring methane? We'll give people another 30 seconds to answer that. All right, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind reading the results again. Sure. So we have a few responses. Um, about 30% of folks marked three and about 67% uh, marked high. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, before we move on, we also wanted to highlight um, here the Global Methane Pledges Waste Pathway, which was launched at COP27. Um, again, to emphasize that tracking of waste emissions helps support the pledge ambitious methane reduction goals. And um, furthermore, there's new technologies include, uh, emerging, um, such as tracking satellites and new data platforms that are either out now or coming online soon. Um, and those are gonna be the focus of today's talks. So I'd I now like to welcome our first two speakers. 
Kate Siegel joined Cleaner Task Force in 2022 and is the Waste Sector Manager on the Methane Pollution Prevention Team. She focuses on issues related to methane mitigation from the waste sector. And prior to joining Cleaner Task Force, Kate worked at Apt Associates as a climate policy specialist where she supported EPA, the US Agency for International Development and other organizations in mitigating greenhouse gas and short-lived climate pollution emissions from solid waste and agriculture. She also worked with clients on improving understanding of the non-climate co-benefits of mitigation and adaptation. And then Tom Frankowitz is a subject matter expert for waste sector methane in the Climate Aligned Industries Program at RMI. He leads RMI's work on methane emissions mitigation and waste management and coordinates the organization's work with the Global Methane Hub. Before joining RMI, Tom worked for more than 16 years in the Climate Change Division of the US EPA. He led the agency's work on waste management and climate change, spearheading technical cooperation with national and municipal governments around the world to mitigate super pollutants like methane and black carbon from solid waste, wastewater, and agricultural waste. And I'll turn it over to you both. Thank you for the great introduction, Clara. All right, so um, some of this has been covered already. Um, it's always a question really of you know how much context people have on methane. Um, assuming some folks or most folks on this call are already familiar, there's just a few things I'd like to flag. You know, one is that waste, um, you know, while it may not get as much attention as some of the other sectors, it's it's the third largest source of emissions behind oil and gas and agriculture. Um, and in the 20 year time frame, of course, methane has 80 times the global warming potential of CO2. Why that's important is that not only is focusing on waste a critical pathway for meeting the global methane pledge by 2030, but that by leaning in on methane, um, leaning in on methane is critical for achieving a 1.5 degree future by 2050. Two barriers that we identified in the waste sector um, in, in taking a look at, at um, in assessing the sector for the waste map project is access to reliable data for waste and sharing of best practices, tools, and resources. This has informed the two-pronged approach that we're taking for the waste, waste methane assessment platform or waste map that RMI and our partners at Cleaner Task Force are undertaking with funding through the Global Methane Hub. The platform itself brings together national and subnational inventory, site-specific data, and satellite observations, as well as tools and resources, and engaging with countries at the national and subnational level to assess interventions and provide technical assistance and capacity building at the municipal level to create a feedback loop of engagement. My colleague, Kate Siegel, will be speaking in more detail about our country engagement. This two-pronged approach is really critical to overcoming these barriers. So a little bit more detail on the platform itself. Part of what makes it unique is that it's open access. One of the barriers that we identified is that many information resources are behind institutional firewalls, whether it's national inventory data that's collected and then not displayed, or tools and resources that may only be available to certain stakeholders, whether it's working with specific aid agencies, donor countries, um, or even sometimes you know, NGOs will have priority countries and platforms that are only accessible to those members. At its heart is the visibility map, which layers multiple levels of detail and types of data in year one with the expectation of using machine learning to stitch together the data in subsequent years, adding additional data uh, and satellite information as it becomes available. Finally, we envision incorporating a decision support tool to help policy officials and city leaders to determine their emissions baseline and assess alternative treatment scenarios. So this is just a mock-up of what we envision waste map looking like, but there's a couple things that I'd like to flag. You know, at the heart of this is the visi visibility map itself, which brings together multiple sources of national, subnational inventory, site-specific, municipal level detail, as well as uh, a range of satellite data that's becoming increasingly available 
as well as in some countries, uh, enhanced relevant and automated monitoring. But we also expect users to engage with this platform in a number of ways. So beyond the, the data, um, there's a number of tools or resources that will be available, our Citizens Waste Champions community, um, as well as a strategic playbooks, a global strategic playbook for deploying various interventions, um, and also a way for stakeholders, whether from our deep dive countries or from other stakeholders in the waste community, uh, to bring them together to engage directly. One of the ways that we've identified to engage more deeply at the municipal level is to work directly with local citizens. As part of the platform deployment, we will be piloting a tool that allows local citizens to take a picture of wild dump sites and upload it to our platform by hitting a submit button. It will become automatically geotagged and then log the dump site location and any additional information that people are able to provide directly to the platform. This is something we'll be rolling out on a pilot basis and as we um, see how it's deployed and how people engage with it, uh, then update it and continue to refine it as it's more widely adopted. To provide some greater detail of our country engagement, I'm going to hand it off next to my co colleague, Kate Siegel from the Cleaner Task Force. Thanks, Tom. So as Tom mentioned, we have this two-pronged approach in WasteMap, the high-level platform, which will house all of our data and case studies and resources, but then we really wanted to pair that with country engagement because we know that we need to, you know, really be improving data on the ground for this platform to be meaningful and to like move data forward in terms of the gaps that we have in terms of availability, in terms of people like folks around the world being able to access um, more data that's currently behind firewalls or you know, in people's inboxes and folders on their computers. So at the country level, we plan to work with both national and subnational governments. Um, at the national level, we would like to work with policymakers and decision makers to increase understanding of waste methane and the solutions um, to mitigate it, uh, help them set um, waste methane reduction targets and work those targets into other national climate goals that they might have, NDCs, climate strategies, um, and so on and so forth. And then at the subnational level, we want to work with government officials, waste officials, um, and other key stakeholders to also build capacity and understanding, but then allow them to speak to each other. So we've seen a lot of success with peer to peer, um, outreach within the waste space where a city in one country is able to talk to a city in their country or a city halfway across the world about the successes they've had, the challenges that they faced and sort of the, the ways in which they found to overcome them. Um, and it really can spark a lot of great ideas um, and South to South collaboration. Um, so, um, and then in addition to, to that capacity building um, support, we also plan to provide targeted technical assistance, um, help improve site specific data and understanding to um, a few key cities within each country that we work with. Uh, so Tom, can you go to the next slide? So those countries are, um, there are six in our first year. So Clean Air Task Force is gonna be working in Latin America, primarily in Mexico, Colombia, and Ecuador, but you know, partnering with other organizations working on West, waste methane throughout the region. Um, RMI is going to be working in Nigeria, India, and the United States in our first year. Um, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to continue this work after 2023 and be able to expand our reach into additional countries and additional regions um, across the world. Um, next slide, I think, Tom. So here are just some key milestones and tentative timelines for you to understand sort of what our work plan looks like. So right now we're in a period of uh, very rapid scale up and assessment. So we are talking to folks on the ground to find local partners that we want to work with to identify the cities that we want to engage with and start speaking with government officials. We're conducting landscape assessments to understand the regulatory framework in places where we haven't yet worked in um, and then use that data to help shore up um, the work that we plan to do for the rest of the year. 
once uh, that's all in line, we hope to start conducting national and subnational level workshops in the summer through the fall, um, just depending on scheduling and, and travel and, and all the rest. Um, throughout this whole time, RMI is going to be developing a beta tool of the WIST map platform um, and then begin testing that tool with users in the late summer, early fall timeframe. Our goal is to really be able to launch um, a first version of waste map and provide a lot of information on what we've been up to over the past year um, at COP in November, and then spending the rest of the year really um, documenting and reporting and making sure that we are able to um, put all of our load all of our information into wa into waste map, communicate with others about why it's important that they also do the same. Um, and hopefully begin preparing for, you know, years two and three. Next slide. Um, so we also wanted to give you a flavor of what we've gotten done in these first couple of months. So I was in Mexico about a month ago now, um, doing some strategic planning, meeting with stakeholders, um, and we met with um, the, municip the municipality of Naucalpan, um, who the US EPA and CCAC have provided support to in the past. So Nalkalpan has been trying to get a um, mechanical biological treatment facility with an anaerobic digester off the round for a number of years now um, because of a number of political reasons, COVID. Um, that project has, you know, still needs a bit of a push. Um, and so we met with them, we toured their landfill, we talked with the operators and and some of the um, you know, the director of public utilities for the municipality while we were there about how we could support them. And so right now we are planning to help them update the waste characterization that EPA did with them five years ago um, because they're being asked for, for new updated information by banks and other private sector partners that they might um, bid on the project and support the municipality in that. Um, and then with that updated data, help them update their 10 year climate action plan for the city to include everything that they, you know, want to be working on in the waste sector. And so, Tom, I think I'll pass it back to you to talk about India. Okay, thank you, Kate. Similarly, we undertook a, um, a similar scoping mission uh, just a few weeks ago to India, where we also in working our way. Uh, starting in Delhi and ending up in Chennai, um, engage with national level, subnational, and local stakeholders. Uh, India is, uh, you, I think, unique both in terms of their Swatch Bharat or Clean India initiative, um, and we really use that as a uh, launching pad for city identification um, and also kind of focusing in on on national level priorities. We worked with the and are working with the um, state of Tamil Nadu. There's a number of key stakeholders, including the um, Tamil Nadu Green Climate Company, which is a board of stakeholders from public and private sector. We are currently assessing the value chain of organic waste to identify areas of assistance. But some of the things that we're seeing already is that um, there's national level initiatives to um, require bulk waste or institutional commercial uh, organic waste generators to treat on site or to pay a vendor to treat, but there's a lot of um, kind of gaps in terms of understanding and policy implementation, uh, whether it's bulk waste generators being unwilling to pay or being insufficient vendors available to treat. Um, and so we're looking at ways to um, build capacity in that area and then identifying specific projects for assistance. One of the ones that has caught our attention is the um, Coin Madhu fresh, uh, fresh food market generates a significant amount of organic waste per day. Previously, there was a uh, anaerobic digester that treated the waste. It's no longer functioning because of operational and contractual issues. And so we're gonna be assessing um, uh, the technical and financial case uh, for alternative treatment, whether it's a new facility or adding to existing facilities um, so that waste is no longer a stranded asset. And we also see that there's a significant amount of additional organic waste uh, where there's currently no treatment options. So we are going to be doing kind of an end-to-end -end value uh, assessment of the waste flow for Chennai, looking at specific projects uh, to demonstrate implementation of, of uh, the organic waste treatment policies, uh, and then also building capacity 
at a regional level by bringing in, uh, in other tier two cities to have peer-to-peer -peer information sharing. Thank you. Oh, I think that's the last slide. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Kate and Tom, for the presentation. Um, it's really exciting to hear about Waste Map and also like the on the ground work that you're doing in parallel. So thank you so much. Um, I will see you again at the end for questions. And um, our next speaker is Mackenzie Huffman. Mackenzie is the Director for Strategy and Partnerships for Carbon Mapper, responsible for advancing opportunities that maximize impact and build meaningful partnerships. Prior to joining Carbon Mapper, she was Vice President for Sustainability at J.P. Morgan Chase, where she worked to develop and advance the firm's climate and sustainability strategy. There, she led the firm's climate and resilience grants making and reporting, monitored industry and policy trends, and led stakeholder engagement on climate policy risk and opportunities. Mackenzie also previously served as the Deputy Chief of Staff at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and in several roles at the Department of Energy, where she focused on policies relating to climate, energy, and finance. Welcome, Mackenzie. Yes, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's good to, to be here. Um, and so after the, the Global Methane Pledge was first announced, the, the focus really shifted from setting ambition to the question of how do you achieve that ambition, which is a lot of why we're here today to talk about measurement and monitoring. Um, and RMI and Clean Air Task Force's work is really critical to, to driving that tangible action. Um, but as they mentioned, you know, a really key element of that is in taking that action is the data and making it useful for decision makers and finding ways to feed it in um, to the efforts on the ground. And so at Carbon Mapper, that's really what we're focused on, this data question, um, and especially for the, the waste sector and where we kind of focus is using some of these advanced technologies to um, bring more visibility to, to methane emissions. Um, and so I thought I would just give some brief context on the landscape of monitoring technologies. And I know there's a lot to this, so I'll just hit the high notes. But there's a lot of emerging tools and technology in the measurement and monitoring space. And a lot of them are, are addressing different parts of this methane measurement and monitoring question. Um, and they are becoming incredibly useful for all sorts of sectors, especially the waste sector. And so on kind of one hand, you have monitoring that supports aggregate accounting and inventory development. And on the other hand, there is measurement and monitoring tools that can support direct mitigation guidance. And so this is really at the local and facility level. Um, and to address both of these different types of monitoring questions, you need this portfolio of technologies and approaches. And these can range from ground-based sensors to airborne to satellites. Um, because as we all know, there is not one sadly magical technology that can answer all of the questions or see all of the methane. Um, but these technologies are really starting to work together um, to support kind of tiered observing strategies to provide more insight on methane emissions overall, which is really, really important and especially important for the waste sector to kind of bring more understanding to those emissions. Um, though, despite this, this really exciting emerging ecosystem of technologies and actors, there are a number of gaps and barriers. And so those always need to be noted. One, you know, trust in the data is still coming along. Um, capacity to use the data is, is a really big one. Um, and then finally, and this is always the big one is, is implementing and scaling these solutions. They, they take a lot of financial and people resources. And so. That's always a huge barrier, um, especially, you know, when you think about a global context. So where Carbon Mapper comes along and where we're focused is that we're really um, built to address um, a number of these gaps and primarily in the context of providing data to guide direct mit mitigation on the ground at the local level um, in the waste sector is, is, a, is, an especially, is a particular focus for us. Um, and so just a little bit about Carbon Mapper, if you aren't familiar with us. So we're a nonprofit um, that is focused on making methane and CO2 data actionable and accessible. Um, we are specifically focused on using remote sensing technology to detect, pinpoint, and quantify methane and CO2 um, point sources, so at the scale of individual facilities. 
And a really important element of the work that we are doing is that all of the methane and CO2 data that we collect and analyze will be publicly available on our public data portal, which is um, you can access via our website. Um, because as was mentioned, having access to this data is really, really critical to action. Um, and it's also why we're really focused on working with organizations like Cleaner Task Force, RMI, and others as part of the Global Methane Initiative to get this data into the hands of those who can use it. So to do all of this work, we actually lead a really unique public-private partnership um, that was powered by philanthropy, and it brings together expertise across policy, science, and technology. Um, it includes partners at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the commerci commercial company Planet Labs, um, the California Air and Resources Board, as well as RMI, among many others. And one of the, the main goals of the coalition is to develop and deploy um, a constellation of methane detecting satellites. And so right now um, we are focusing on work, we're working to launch two satellites um, by later this year and early next. But the ultimate goal is to try to expand those capabilities to allow for more frequent measurement and monitoring. At Carbon Mapper, we also conduct a number of aerial methane surveys using a similar instrument that's on the satellites. Um, but instead will, is on an airplane. Um, and to date, we've lar largely focused on the US and Canada, but are actually currently in the middle of a campaign in South America, which is really exciting. And we've seen a ton, especially um, in the waste sector. And so with that background, you know, I mentioned that our where we are mostly focused is on data gaps at the at the direct mitigation level. And so um, what that looks like for remote sensing is that means that we're focused on what we call high emission point sources. Um, that's really where we are optimized to see um, emission events. And you can see an example here of a plume at a landfill. And this is kind of, you know, very similar to what we tend to observe using the remote sensing tools that we have. Um, and so generally, you know, there are two types of these types of sources that make up net emissions. So there's the point sources, which are large high emission events that are at, you know, the level of individual facilities and then area sources, which are more diffuse sources of methane over larger areas. And the reason we focus on high emission point sources is one, we were optimized for it in part because studies have shown that um, a handful of high emission methane point sources um, in some regions can contribute between 20 to 60% of regional methane emissions. And what that means is that if you are able to identify these emissions and then work to address those sources, it can lead to some real impacts on reducing regional emissions. Um, but the key is that we need to be able to see them. Um, and, you know, we see high emission sources across a number of major sectors, which I don't need to tell everybody here, but oil and gas, ag, um, coal, uh, and waste. Um, and then obviously addressing methane and these sources leads to um, a lot of community be benefit in the terms of air quality and public health. And so this is a bit why we are um, focused on getting more data about these sources and especially bringing more visibility to the waste sector, which can help to support major emissions reductions through a lot of these great initiatives that are ramping up and getting underway. Um, you know, as we all talked about, the waste sector has been underemphasized for too long. And so, and one of the biggest challenges that we do have around waste methane is that we have limited information globally about, you know, where are the emissions generally, um, as well as kind of getting more information on their root causes. Um, but these advanced technologies, as more and more of them come online and more of that data is made publicly available, we're beginning to fill more of those data gaps um, and especially help inform improvements and prioritize investments on the ground. And, and especially, and this is something we're really excited about with um, once the satellites launch and the global visibility, is supporting countries who don't have access to this kind of data today or it's really, really hard to get. Um, as Kate mentioned, you know, a lot of times it's behind paywalls or hard, just harder to access. Um, and so our approach for the satellites has been informed by a, a lot of ongoing work using aerial methane surveys um, that have driven mitigation. And so just this is one kind of real world example of where this type of data helped to reduce emissions. Um, and so this was at Sunshine Canyon landfill in California. 
And so between 2016 and 2017, research scientists conducted an airborne methane survey over the Sunshine Canyon landfill in California using a NASA imaging spectrometer, which is what allows us to detect these emissions. And the survey identified a number of methane plumes above 1,000 kilograms an hour. Um, that data was shared with operators and regulators, and they worked together to identify the root causes of the emissions and then target improvements and implement those improvements. And we continued doing aerial overflights, which helped to inform at, as the improvements were being implemented and then also helped to validate emission reduction efforts. And so you can kind of see the before and after to the right uh, as they were um, actually in practice updating and mitigating some of these emissions. The community also experienced a benefit. So this graph is really tiny and hard to see, but essentially it shows that the reductions in methane also correlated with a reduction in odor complaints, which was one of the driving factors in kind of pushing for more mitigation at this particular site. Um, and so just to this just tries to illustrate how it's really helpful to be able to see how these improvements helped to reduce methane. Um, but as we all know, these waste sites are really dynamic and new emission events can continually occur in do, new places or in the same places. And so what's also equally important is to sustain monitoring and to make sure that we um, to make sure that emissions stay down and we can catch events as they occur to really try to keep our methane budget in line. Um, and so building on the work that we have done with our airborne surveys, last year we announced a new waste methane initiative. initiative um, and as part of this effort, we will be working to develop a global baseline assessment of high emission waste sites. And so to do this, we will be leveraging um, our regional airborne campaigns that are underway currently, as well as leveraging satellite data. This is a two year initiative. Um, and so this year, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll be using, we'll be analyzing detections from our airborne campaign, as well as from um, the NASA instrument EMIT, which is an instrument that's currently on the International Space Station, but it has capabilities to detect methane point sources. And then next year, um, we will be leveraging detections from our coalition satellites once they've launched. And this work will dramatically scale up insight into methane emissions of upwards to of 10,000 waste sites globally. So providing a lot of really granular data um, for a lot of new sites, which is great. And our goal is to really build on and complement um, the work that is part of the Global Methane Pledge Waste Pathway and to help support and drive, get this data into the hands of those who, who can use it, um, which is really, really critical. And so we've been doing a lot of work to engage and help inform, you know, policies, operational monitoring, um, and uh, investments for waste sites. And most importantly, we are working really closely with with our partners to do that. Um, and so, my final note: this is kind of just gives you a good sense of the kind of coverage that we'll have and where we're planning to target our observations. You can kind of see that, you know, to date, the regional surveys have been really informative, but they offer really limited coverage. And this is where the global visibility of satellites can provide some game changing visibility into methane emissions. Um, and the carbon mapper co coalition satellites are specifically designed to optimize for global point sources. And so to really give us visibility into as many of these sources as possible. Um, all around the world at a really granular level. And so it really is going to help identify prime targets for mitigation and help to drive action um, on the ground. And we're re working really closely with partners in RMI and Cleaner Task Force, um, as well as other groups um, like C40 and through Global Methane Hub to make sure that key regions in the waste sector and that are a focus of our NGO partners and others will be included in these observations to just make sure that the data we're collecting can actually feed into efforts that are ongoing um, and on the ground. Um, and I didn't include an image of it, but we do have a, da a data platform um, and we will all of the data that we collect and analyze will um, be available on that platform. So to date, it's really just our aerial surveys, but we will slowly be filling it up with our analysis of the EMIT data, which is very exciting. Um, and we're also in the process of updating that portal uh, to make it a little bit more user friendly. So that's actually really exciting. Um, and those will be coming kind of later this summer and early fall. So a lot of um, great ongoing work to make this data more user friendly and a little bit more actionable. And so really looking forward to taking questions.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Kenzie. Um, that was great. Um, I just want to encourage the audience to keep posting questions in the chat. Um, before that, I will um, summarize some key takeaways um, just before we get up to the Q&A. So um, first, to summarize, the Global Methane Initiative has some great resources on measurement reporting and verification that we encourage you all to access. Um, waste map, um, highlighted methane emission, uh, will highlight when it launches uh, methane emissions, reduction opportunities, and best practices to accelerate achieving global methane pledge goals. And finally, satellite detection capabilities like Carbon Mapper will enable identification of persistent high emitting sources globally. So also please just want to mention, stay tuned for our next webinar in the series um, where we'll explore best practices and some case studies. Okay, now I will open up the Q&A. Um, so for one of the first questions we received is um, for Kate and Tom, um, will waste map be expanded to more countries other than shown in the presentation and what will be the timeline? I think you did touch on this briefly, but if you could. Um, yeah, okay. no, and and we've been asked a similar question in the past. So the launch of the platform, which Tom can talk a little bit more about, will, in, will have a global coverage and we'll be pulling in, you know, open source data from inventories and, and what, you know, we are able to gather um, at, at its launch. Our, our in-country work will be in those six countries in year one. And then with additional funding, we would like to expand into other countries in year two. But all of this is to say, if you know, you're in Brazil, for example, and you, you know, want better data on Brazil and you have it, um, it, you know, within your grasp and you want to see it in the platform, please send it to us and we will upload it so that others are able to, you know, get access and see your contributions. And, and um, but for the first year, the in-country engagement will just be in, in those six countries. Tom, anything to add there? No, I think that covers it. I mean, we are going to be doing our best to get global data. Uh, we're reaching out to stakeholders. We're starting, you know, we're kind of start working our way up the pyramid, starting with the um, kind of globally available information that that may be less detailed, and working our way up to more details, but then all uh, with with less coverage. So, um, part of the reason why we're 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 participating in webinars like this. Um, is, is to really get the word out about the platform so stakeholders know that they can engage with us directly to start sending us information because, um, you know, recognizing that as we get more granularity, we, we may not have national coverage. It's still really helpful to have representative data from two or three cities that can be modeled up um, rather than, you know, just national inventories that we then apply uh, down. Great. Thank you so much for the updates. Um, Kenzie, a few people have asked how carbon mappers quantifying um, emission rates and the uh, limit of detection. I don't know if you um, I could speak to yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I will say is I can, uh, there are a number of studies that provide the detailed methodology of the quantification on our website that I can share. Um, but we have a, a science team um, that is actually that that does that analysis, and I am not a scientist, and so cannot speak to it in the the most appropriate way. But I will say that it is definitely um, definitely uh, we have a, a number of efforts underway that that really work to validate those quantifications. Um, so doing controlled release studies as well as some blind studies using the Air, airborne survey or aerial surveys um, through different operators as well to make sure that those um, quantification estimates are um, as accurate as possible. We also do include a number of uncertainty rates, so um, it kind of can better um, inform that, but I can send some materials that will um, answer those questions a little bit more effectively than I can. In terms of the detection limit for the satellite, so that's a great question because that is what's really important so as I mentioned, we specialize in point sources. Um, 
and so we do need kind of high emission events at a very localized um, scale. And so for the airborne surveys, the detection threshold is, is around 10 kilograms per hour. And then for the satellites, it's about 100 kilograms per hour. So what we'll be able to detect with the satellites is, is most of these high emission sources. What we can't detect is anything below that, which is why I was really emphasizing the, the need for uh, tiered observing systems, because there's a lot of methane in that in between where other sensors and other monitoring tools are, are definitely needed to be able to really see where the methane is coming from and what it is. But by being able to kind of identify the low hanging fruit in a sense and, and the big emission events that can help to target and give us a better, better um, sense. And there's a number of other initiatives or um, methane satellite um, initiatives underway where we're really also hoping to build together. So we work, you know, there's Tripomi, which is a global mapper um, and helps to really identify huge, huge, huge sources. And that can help to, to tailor where um, satellites like ours, which focus on more point sources, can can look to better um, target specific areas. But then there's also methane sat, um, which is coming online as well. Thanks. Um, and then another question that came up that's interesting is, um, let's say there is something like the Sunset Canyon that you showed where the um, facility operators are actually working to mitigate that event. Um, is that something that they can share with Carbon Mapper and like kind of include that um, to like when that event is reported or, yeah. I think I'm tracking the full question, but so, and I saw another question in the chat about kind of how many um, operators tend to um, report mitigation of events that we've seen as well. And so what I'll say is broadly, so we actually did a full survey in California. Um, so some of the insights um, that we have is we did, there's this been this effort, really concentrated effort working with the California Air and Resources Board and others in California over many years called the California Methane Survey. And in that, a lot of this data was collected and then shared with operators. And the operators themselves, um, in, in that kind of study, about half of the operators took voluntary action to mitigate those emissions. And so that was actually really um, great to see. And so now that study spanned more than just waste. So it included landfills and um, feedlots and, or sorry, uh, clear oil and gas and feedlots as well as waste. Um, but that's really what we have seen. Um, and then the um, Sunshine the Canyon case study is actually featured in our um, RMI waste methane report, uh, best practices report. So there's a lot more detail there, um, especially on waste and quantification um, that I would encourage folks to take a look at because it's a really good overview of how um, this type of quantification can actually support waste methane best practice best practices in the in the waste sector. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to take one of the questions quickly. Um, there's a question to all panelists if there's any guidance on pilot level field quantification of biogas emissions from landfill sites that don't have an established collection network and resources for that. Um, so one resource that I know of is um, the US EPA's landfill methane outreach program, which is um, all about encouraging gas capture. And so it is US based, but there's a project development handbook that talks about all about um, you know, how to capture and store gas and what it can be used for. Um, I don't know if anyone had anything else to add on that question. No, I, I, I think that's really helpful, Clara. And um, you know, I would just add right now, and this is kind of one of the one of the challenges I think uh, the type of enhanced monitoring that, that Mackenzie mentioned is really trying to get at is you know, when you don't have a collection system, then you're really relying on modeling. And uh, you know, without with with kind of sidestepping the debate about models, they're they're only as good as the waste characterization data that you have. <clears throat> and so in situations where you don't have very good data on the site either, the model becomes increasingly inaccurate. And so there really needs to be a combination of both modeling uh, to fill in these gaps, but then also um, uh, satellite, you know, uh, aerial, uh, drone, a uh, variety of measurement technologies that um, are increasingly doing a much better job at quantification uh, beyond just leak detection. And so that, that's one of the challenges that this is trying to get at. 
Um, I'll just add, I read that question a, a little bit differently talking about like at, at the site. So in the US, landfill operators are required to do like surface emissions monitoring with like a handheld gas analyzer. So there that that does happen, whether or not you consider that to be very e effective or efficient is another question. Um, RMI's guide that they put out last summer actually has a good description of all of the different ground level like measurement and monitoring devices that could be and are being tested for um, landfill use, but I don't think that there are any, there are no resources that I know of that are a guide to like how to actually go about using those materials to measure emissions at landfills. Um, but as Tom and Kenzie mentioned, like that, this is what people are, this is what many in the field are thinking about and trying to understand right now. So it's an area of like active research and I'm sure things will be coming out soon. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, okay, take a look at the questions again. So, uh, Kate and Tom, one question that came up is how are your are how are your data collection methodologies going to be documented um, for waste? Management? Yeah, thank you. And I'm trying to track these questions and prioritize them, but it's uh, a little hard to follow them as they're coming up. Yeah. Um, so if I think if I understand that correctly in terms of the methodology for data collection, um, th there's maybe, you know, I guess kind of two kinds or two buckets of methodology. I mean, there's the actual like firsthand data collection. Um, so, you know, we were working with groups like UNEP and their, uh, their Waste Wise Cities tool, um, which has really, you know, some of the best, I think, documented methodology for data collection, but uh, it, it can also be um, labor intensive or expensive to, to implement. And so, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, encourage the use of, uh, of that methodology and partner with UNEP uh, for firsthand data collection, but also recognizing, you know, we're, we're mostly uh, collecting uh, existing data at this point, um, you know, with, with exception of, of some of the firsthand data collection that we're doing, um, uh, through our country engagement. So for that, uh, part of the kind of this open platform approach that we're taking is any data that is um, incorporated into the, to the platform will be both documenting, uh, you know, the, the, the source, obviously, um, providing kind of the full data set uh, and also kind of trying to highlight some of the distinctions in the methodologies used and the fields included. So we're really trying to, um, you know, again, I mean, the, the, I think, uh, I, I think uh, it's really important to flag because I think sometimes people just expect these platforms to, to just show everything and have it be brilliant. But part of, I think, the, the value proposition of this platform is bringing together all these disparate sources and being really clear about where the data is coming from, what's included and what's not. Because um, as many of you in the waste sector know, um, we're big proponents of recycling. But unfortunately, the data is highly recycled and oftentimes a variety of reports is still coming from just, you know, two or three main sources of data. Um, and so we're, we're trying to be very clear about where our data is coming from. Thanks, Tom. And I guess um, not from the chat, but one of the other questions um, we thought might come up kind of on that note of the data is, are there any best practices for dealing with missing data? Um, so I'll say on that, that the there's IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventories that have methods for resolving data gaps, um, like overlap and surrogate data interpolation. Um, but, you know, project developers have to use methods that they think are reasonable and supported by data during the measurement period. And um, there's, it, it is definitely a tricky question. Um, and if there's any substitution methods, it should always be noted um, and articulated. I don't know if you, I'll have anything else to add on that. Take a quick look at the question box again. So there's one question, is the data verified and used in permitting and compliance by regulators? And I think that remains to be seen for all of the technologies. These are like really new and, and coming online. Um, so TBD on that one. Um, 
Hey, Claire, I have a question that yeah. it, it popped into my Q and A, so I don't know if it went into the. Oh yeah, one. it's possible. I meant to ask you all if people had sent ones directly to you. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Okay, I was a little confused about that, so I'm gonna um, I'll go ahead and read the question then as well. Um, this is from uh, Javier Bilbao. Um, so North America and Europe are, are considered good at mitigating emissions from the waste sector. Every landfill collects biogas and burns it or uses it to generate electricity or RNG or bio, biomethane. In other areas of the world, Asia, Africa, South America, gas collection is not that common, correct? If so, the main effort, uh, what we can do to mitigate methane emissions in the waste sector outside of Europe, what is, um, uh, how, what is the main effort we can do to mitigate emissions in the waste sector outside of Europe and North America? Is it to regulate gas collection systems? So I'll, I'll reframe that a little bit. I mean, yes, there's, you know, um, different parts of the world, there's going to be different approaches just based on current landfill gas treatment. Um, you know, I think in Western Europe and North America, um, you know, Australia, Japan, well, I would say Australia, I think they rely heavily on landfilling and gas collection is required or implemented to some degree. Um, you know, and in the US, because we do have an extensive landfill system, you're, and, and with the, you know, with the introduction of the low carbon fuel standard, renewable portfolio standard, you're seeing an increasing amount of uh, landfill gas energy projects that, that, that are um, using RNG as the, you know, kind of the offtake. Uh, although electricity is still the dominant, uh, just in terms of numbers. Um, you know, but I think one thing that, um, you know, initiatives like carbon mapper are identifying is that there's still a significant amount of leaks coming out of them. So, um, I mean, one landfill gas collection is, is not required for all landfills. It's above a certain size and after a certain amount of waste is in place. And so there's a lot of emissions coming out of those sites, but even the ones with gas collection systems, efficiency is, um, you know, not as good. Um, as I think had previously been anticipated. So there's a lot more that can be done there and that's where enhanced mitigation or enhanced monitoring really comes into play. In countries where gas friction is not required, a different approach does have to be taken. So there's still definitely a role for better data and monitoring, um, but then you know, that's where things like uh, organics diversion uh, and, and you know, avoidance of the waste from going to the dump sites really becomes a factor. Um, I, I guess, you know, just to, to kind of fully kind of circle around in this, um, you know, in, in countries with uh, more extensive gas collection, it's still real because collection efficiency is much lower than previously assumed, organic waste diversion is still a priority. And in some uh, ways, it's even harder to introduce in countries with well-established treatment systems because there's so much investment already made in that infrastructure. So it's still, you know, one way or other, it's a combination of improving monitoring, promoting gas collection, uh, but really leaning in on organics diversion. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tom, for bringing that like end to end um, approach um, in there and for uh, pulling out that question. Um, I think that is a good place to close us out. So um, I want to thank all of you again so much for speaking and thank you to everyone for joining. If you have time, please, um, it would be great if you could uh, submit the feedback form that's going to come up on the screen. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, Claire. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kate. Thank you all.